is Archon, aka Fifth Rate Duelist, and I'm here with Patrick Hoban, who is widely regarded one of the best Yu-Gi-Oh players in history, one of the great minds of Yu-Gi-Oh, and he wrote a book called The Road of the King, um, which is a pretty good um, explanation and guide to kind of deck building and learning how to play the better and strategize and things like that. So I'll let Patrick introduce himself. Yeah, hey, how's it going? Uh, good to be here, and thanks for having me. Um, yeah, I'm excited to be back into the game. I, uh, you know, I played for most of the game's history, and then I took about a four-year break uh, and just started playing about a year ago. But I'm excited for all the events we have coming up. Okay, great. Awesome. So can you tell us how you got into Yu-Gi-Oh! and what drew you to it originally? Yeah, sure. I mean, I started playing as a kid. Um, I showed up at like a Books a Million one day with my friends. Uh, and I think we were all on Pokemon at the time. But, uh, you know, I showed up one Saturday like normal and they were just like, we're all on Yu-Gi-Oh now. <laughs> and uh, they eventually talked me into it. And I, I bought a pack and pulled a Time Wizard and I was kind of hooked. Oh, nice. Yeah, the Time Wizard is definitely going to do it if there's anything. I was also pretty lucky though, because I got um, started in like goat format to like 2005. I, you know, I was still a kid. I wasn't going to events or anything, but I did learn about metagame pretty early, which was like the first coverage site for the game. Um, and so I got like pretty early exposure to like Shonen Jumps and things like that. Like I remember reading about the coverage of you know goat format nationals and things like that. Okay. Like, when you played, were you naturally good at the game, or did you suck and get better? Oh, no, I sucked for a long time. Because, <laughs> uh, like, <laughs> definitely for a long time. So, I think that it, it's a little weird, because when you start off as a kid, it's, like, a little bit different. It's, like, a different scale, I guess. Um, but even though some of the kids now are pretty good... Um, but for most of my early years, I did not. Uh, I think I taught my first regional in like 2007. I started playing in like 2002. Uh, so it was like five years to top a regional. And then I taught my first like real event. Uh, this is one of the last shown in jumps actually in 2010. Um, and then uh, I still wasn't like particularly great at the game. I was just like, okay. Um, and then in 2012 was like the first year I really started to travel um to to play all the different events and i bubbled pretty much every single event the entire year uh so definitely did not start out being very good oh man i asked that of every like pro player that i've had on this stream and like they all said that originally they started out sucking which is like kind yeah. of going <laughs> to be i was like it doesn't seem like anyone's like naturally good at the game from like there yeah players. i don't think so yeah, type of thing. Okay. So, like, what was it that kind of shifted you from being, like, casual to, like, a competitive player? Like, did you have a revelation one day? Or, like, uh, did you, like, have a mentor in your life? Like, what shifted you? Um, It was probably the environment, I would say. Uh, so, you know, you start off as a kid. But I also found like online play pretty early. And when I grew up, I wasn't really close to like any locals or anything. Um, and my mom wasn't about to drive me like an hour to go play a local. Uh, so I caught on to um, like online Yu-Gi-Oh! like pretty early. I think like 2006 is probably the first time I heard of it, but 2007 was like really when I started using it. Um, because like at first it was YVD, it was like before Dueling Book, before Dueling Network. Um, you had to download it, and the, for the first, like, year that I tried to use it, I couldn't even make it work. Um, it was probably some combination of I wasn't a very, very technical kid versus, like, it, you know, it was early internet, kind of, so it wasn't, like, probably great technology either. Um, and so somewhere along there, I just, like, couldn't make it work for a good amount of time after I first started trying to use it. And then after I did get it to work, uh, the first, like, year that I played with it was without pictures, and, like, all the cards were just, like, white spaces, um, but from there, I started to uh, get into like warring and like uh, ETC forums, duelist grounds, stuff like that. And then I got uh, kind of thrown into like the the more competitive scene like that. I would say. Okay. Um, do you feel like you attribute you getting better mostly to other players or yourself and your own insights? 
Uh, yeah, I mean, it was a, it was definitely a group effort. Like, I had really awesome people to test with, uh, with Desmond right now, actually. Uh, we tested together a bunch, uh, Leverett's, and it was, um, it was kind of the environment again where, like, we all just wanted to get better, so we just, you know, collectively did it as a group. Okay, that's fair. So the power of friendship helped you to improve at the game. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Um... So, uh, for a long time, I've heard about your book, The Return of the, or sorry, The Road to the King. I was about to say Return of the King, but that's much different. <laughs> you did not write that. If you did, I would be like simping over you, but yeah, more <laughs> of the Rings fan. Um, so can you tell us more about your book and kind of what's in your book? Yeah, sure. So, um, I released it in 2016. Um, but basically I wanted to just teach like a complete approach to the game, uh, rather than something that's like format specific of why this thing is better than that. I wanted to like kind of show, you know, these are all the different aspects of the game. So it's like six sections. I'm not even sure I can remember all six off the top of my head, but it's basically like mindset, um, technical play, deck building, um, mind games, uh, maybe like the structure of the tournaments and kind of how they like vary um and how that can affect it uh something like that but basically where um it, it's basically trying to teach how to approach winning a tournament rather than from like a specific formats perspective but like kind of the principles that apply across all the different formats okay um would you say like any particular book are like not relevant anymore or are still relevant or how would you classify that? Yeah, I do think that, uh, you know, I see I've had a handful of people ask me if, it, if I thought it was important to like make updates to it. Um, and maybe at some point there will be, uh, I don't know that I really think that point is yet though, because I don't feel like enough has changed. Like there's, there's kind of different, periods of Yu-Gi-Oh! There's like early Yu-Gi-Oh! where like the cards aren't very good. Um, middle, I'd say is like, you know, from like when the Destiny Hero cards first came out, you know, like Perfect Circle, stuff like that. And then on into like Teledad, all the way up through probably like windups, um, where the cards are like getting better, but they're not like great cards. Uh, but they could still like do some cool things and, you know, probably beat you with it. Um, and then you kind of have like more modern Yu-Gi-Oh! And it's like more defined by you just pick what you want to kind of try and do. And then, um, you know, more often than not, you're like trying to floodgate them, put up, follow up, all those kinds of things have kind of been true for the last like, you know, 10 plus years. And, you know, there may be a point where there's like a, another period where, you know, uh, we can search anything that we want. And I think that as new cards come out, we're really getting closer and closer to that. Um, but in general, like the same kind of principles do still apply. Uh, so I don't know if I think, it, we're ready for an update yet okay do you feel like the cards like like i guess uh, if i were to ask about power creep to anyone i feel like you would probably be the perfect person to ask like do you think the cards are becoming like too powerful now or are we still like able to have a fair and balanced game uh so i like the power creep um you know i think in general from like a deck building perspective it's just more options than you had and so, like, you know, if every few months you get, like, 100 new cards and they're, like, incrementally better than the older cards, um, then, yeah, there's definitely been a power creep that's been going on since the beginning of the game. Um, but as a deck builder, I, I kind of like it because it's just more options. Okay, that's fair. Um, what's your thoughts on, like, Tier 0 formats, like the one that we have right now? Is that healthy for the game or not healthy for the game? It's not bad. Um, you know, I think that this format would probably be one of the most skillful of all time. And it, it still is up there. Like, look at the people who've won the events. They're all people who have won multiple events in the past. Um, and that's usually a sign that the format is pretty good. Um, I do understand that there will always be more people that aren't competitive than there will ever be people who are competitive, though. And so from like a game design perspective, um, you know, I feel like the, the majority of people probably don't like it as much. Uh, and so I think you can do it, you know, every so often. And I do think they tend to be like better formats. Um, 
but just from like a health of the game perspective you you probably don't want to carry it on for too long that's fair type of a thing yeah i don't know like i like tier limit but uh i just know so many people have just left the game because of it so i guess that goes back to like health of the game versus like you know the importance of technical play um but i did see someone argue on twitter that like having tier zero formats also means that deck building is like less important because everyone's playing the same deck basically like what kind of thoughts do you have on yeah that? yeah sure it can be um for sure because like from a deck building perspective you know i think there's like different points in the game and i don't think every event is winnable i think specifically the most winnable events are right after a new set comes out um and then probably the second most winnable events are after a new ban list comes out but i do think ban lists are like less impactful than new cards and so uh yeah i just i don't think every i don't really think every event is winnable in general and so from a tier zero perspective i think that those first like you know one or two events of the tier zero format are still probably the more winnable events um but then that advantage goes away later in the format but i think that's true in every format because at some point like the game just you kind of figure out what's the best and you can just like keep building up as much as you'd like to uh and so you kind of lose the advantage of, of deck building later in the format of pretty much any format i think oh i see okay yeah would you still say deck building superior to technical play Yeah, I do think so. Um, I mean, I think Yu-Gi-Oh! is fundamentally a deck-building game. Uh, like, the difference in Yu-Gi-Oh! and Magic is basically that Magic has mana and Yu-Gi-Oh! doesn't. And so Magic necessitates, like, a back-and-forth because of it, whereas in Yu-Gi-Oh! it's more, uh, I want to build a deck that, you know, with any given five-card combination, I can do the thing I'm trying to do. Okay. Um... Yeah, because, I don't know, I guess from, like, someone who's obviously not, like, that experienced in the game, because I haven't been playing very long, like, I'll see top deck lists, but they're all, like, so different from each other that I'm just sort of like, is deck building really that important? Because it seems like as long as you know how to play the deck and you're a good, like, player, like, it doesn't seem like it matters that much to me. I think there are different kinds of deck building advantages that you can gain. Um, there's, you know, a difference between like a 10% and a 10 times advantage is like you always want to shoot for the 10 times advantages. And so an example of how you could like do that in a current format would be um, you would have to be able to sure put up an unbreakable board, give yourself follow up, all the normal things for going first. But I think the mark of a best deck and where you gain like a true deck building advantage would be like a deck that could do that they did it getting dweller because like dweller is like a huge defining thing in the tier mirror um and maybe that didn't interact with the bestial cards and so like fundamentally your deck just like doesn't care what the other decks in the meta are doing um i think that's like a way to gain a real deck building advantage but the problem again is that it's not always possible because like there's there's not really a world where you can like play tier cards which is you know the best engine currently in the game and also not care about dweller and so like you could know what the thing would look like if it were to exist but it, it doesn't necessarily mean that you can ever actually get to it in a specific format where i think you would have to do it would be before you know, everyone figured out that we were going to summon Dweller and put up Beatrice and Solik, and it's like a really good field and everything like that. Um, you would have had to do it before people were making Dweller, because in the current format, at least, there's, I don't think there's really a way to build a deck where you don't care about it. Mm, that makes sense. Yeah, type of thing. Have you looked at the decks from, like, post-Photon Hypernova? Um... So a little bit. I've read the set within the last week, so it is all fairly new. Um, but the other thing is I haven't really looked at any decks. Like I've built some decks myself and like seen what kind of synergy I can find between them. Uh, but I haven't really like looked at too many decks. Okay. Okay. Um, 
So you said that you took like a four year break, right? Um, yep. So like, kind of what was like, what was the reason for the break and what made you come back to Yu-Gi-Oh? Yeah, sure. Uh, the reason for the break was basically to just work on my company. I was starting a company at the time and uh, really needed to focus like everything I could on that. Um, and then, you know, fast forward a few years and now we're starting to like get a little better off, be more stable as opposed to just like just starting out. Um, and you really want to get out of the house. Like I've been working at home for like, you know, five years now. <laughs> Okay, yeah, that'll do it type of a thing. Um, yeah, I think, like, I mean, I guess I took, like, a eight-year break or something like that. But, like, I only came back because I found my Yu-Gi-Oh cards in the garage. Uh, my mom's nice. garage. And I was like, oh, I used to play this. And, like, I got <laughs> my, like, Gravekeeper structure deck. Because that's what I played with because I was too broke to afford good cards. I, I played with a Gravekeeper structure deck and I brought it in 2019 to eternal format um and hey, the gravekeepers are crazy they they dominated a, a tournament like no other deck did like with fraser and sean mccabe they uh it wasn't even really a part of the format and they got first second and third in the ycs oh wow yeah i remember like i don't know if i had like more knowledge of the game and resources and like money to afford good cards <laughs> like i think it would have been sick i could have been like the next Ishizu or something like that. <laughs> but alas, um, that Royal Tribute, how many games I've won with Royal Tribute. <laughs> yeah, Royal Tribute is a crazy card. <laughs> yeah, but I don't know. I'm dreaming for the day that like maybe Gravekeepers can be good again if they get like some support, <laughs> maybe. I don't know. Do you have a deck hey, like they that? Have really that good cards. Love that's just bad. Oh, I've got a ton of decks like that. Uh... <laughs> You know, I, I, I love DDD. It feels like the deck that got away. Um, like, I put a ton of effort into that deck, and I thought I had a really good build of it. Um, but it, it was a deck that just, like, couldn't deal with Maxi at the time. Uh, and so that was a deck that, like, it really felt like I got away. I was really, like, Ignite. Um, I've got a bunch of decks. And I really, like... Uh, I feel like I'm a, kind of an optimist when it comes to deck building, so like I'll get excited about a bunch of ideas, and then you know nine out of ten of them are bad. <laughs> and uh, so yeah, I've built up a lot of things that I I like that aren't necessarily good currently. <laughs> yeah, I feel it. I don't know. I just like feel like there's like two decks in my life that I just love, and I want to play them again so bad, but. Bistids are thing. <laughs> the other one's Drytron. I'm like obsessed with Drytron. Um, yeah. yeah, I won so much money and <laughs> like prizes for which <laughs> Drytron was really big. It was like my deck that I like really did well with. Um, but alas, things happen like ban lists and, and Bistids come out and and issues you cards that just make it unplayable. And then you're just yeah. <laughs> the whole time type of a thing. Um, you should do cards are really interesting designs. Tell me more. Like, just being able to shuffle back things, I think, is, like, probably one of the main missing dynamics that has been, you know, there hasn't been, like, great ways to uh, keep recursion going in, in kind of recent formats as much as there was with, you know, when, let's say, that goes to Emerald was playing, you, you know, use it multiple times and put mul a bunch of things back. Um, and so the issues cards being able to do that with anything, I think is really powerful. Um, but they are interesting because I think they are best as like a big engine, uh, you know, like the ones that you can special when by pitching one, you know, they get worse if you don't max out on them because they're just going to be like, you know, not going to do anything some percentage of the time. And you do have to kind of play like a bigger engine, uh, to play them, I think, or to play them well. I know that on Twitter we were having like really big arguments about how Bistid and Ishizu cards have ruined the game because like I mean they're interesting maybe but they have rendered all graveyard decks like pretty much unplayable now um, as a result so like I think they're yeah, better but... than I think they're better designed than cards that are more like Floodgates because like Floodgates you just like you either drew the out or you didn't, and there's not really anything you can do. Whereas, like, there's at least interaction. Like, you could, you know, make, like, an Earth Charmer and force the shuffle back 
and then play your graveyard effects. And so, like, when you're not sitting across from Floodgates, I think that's, in general, like, a more healthy game. Um, so I think it's better than the alternative. That's fair. Um, I would say they're definitely healthier than Floodgates type of a thing. Floodgates are, uh, <laughs> floodgates are kind of the fundamental problem of Yu-Gi-Oh, I think. Do you think the game would be better if there were no floodgates? For sure. But it's also <laughs> like, uh, short of like, if you're going to ban 100 cards, like, I don't know how you would get rid of them at this point either. Yeah, that's fair. Like, there's a lot of. Because the, even if you ban, like, the best ones, like, there are other ones that are just, like, right behind that, like, if we couldn't use the ones we use now, that we would just use those floodgates instead. So you would literally have to ban, like, 100 cards to actually get rid of them. And that just doesn't seem very realistic. Yeah, that's fair. Type of a thing. What I do think they should concentrate on, though, is probably lingering effect floodgates. Like, those are probably the worst kind. Things like, even if they aren't played in any given format, I, I think just, you know, off principle, these kind of cards should be banned. Cards like uh, Dimension Barrier, because, like, once it's flipped, you can't do anything. Scythe, uh, Dweller, you know, anything that's a lingering effect that, like, you can't even really draw the out, you know? Uh, oh where you don't even have like a chance to interact i think those are probably the worst kind of floodgates though okay yeah yeah i didn't think about that i know that um my friend was playing tier and he lost to the barrier and um i think it's called different dimension ground or something and like both yeah different those... dimension ground is a lingering one <laughs> yeah type of thing yeah i didn't think about that um I guess, I don't know, maybe, like, certain decks wouldn't be able to compete if they didn't have those type of floodgates, but it does seem... I think that is why we are where we are with floodgates, um, because, again, you know, there will always be more players that are competitive than there are who are, so I think floodgates are a way to kind of balance the otherwise skill gap in them. And so from, like, a game design perspective, they almost make sense, um... But from, like, a competitive play standpoint, I think they're, they're pretty problematic. Yeah. Yeah, I think if, like, we got rid of Floodgates, we'd have to better play, like, archetypes like Eldritch and, and all those types of things. And it's like, well, how do you even do that type of a thing? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, but also Dweller seems kind of needed to check tier. So... And D barrier and DDG also check tier, so in a way, doesn't that make them good? I think I'm okay with Dweller if if like a deck that isn't a tier mirror is playing Dweller. I think I'm okay with it being in the game, and I know you can't like, do this, but in a tier mirror, it's kind of unfair because they kind of skip your turn, and then they have infinite follow up. So even if they even if you get rid of their board, like they don't fundamentally care. Um, but I think that if a deck that wasn't to your someone's dweller i think it's it's more reasonable yeah that's fair yeah it does seem like watching those ycs's it's like the player that made dweller typically was the one that won type of thing yeah i i i paid attention to a lot of games and, the, uh, and kind of a shocking amount of decided by dweller going first in the mirror because it's like the mirror would be it is it is like a very skillful and interactive mirror, but at the same token, it would just be like hands down one of the best ever if Dweller just weren't a factor. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, I think it would be a lot more interesting too. Type of a thing. Yeah. Okay, so a lot of my viewers are more like on the casual end, but uh, a lot of them are also like casual but they want to get more competitive like that's why i started my channel because i was casual but i wanted to like go to a ycs and like try it out yep. and stuff like that so a question that everyone tends to ask is like well how do we go from casual to competitive and how do we get better at the game yeah sure um i mean the main thing you have to do is like just do it you know like if you have a friend group that also shares those same kind of goals um or if you don't maybe the first thing you should do is to find that friend group that that does because it's a lot easier when you have people that like want to do the same kind of thing and are willing to like put in the effort to get better at it um and so yeah i'd say start with that okay yeah i think that's been a also play test with your hands face up 
I think I think it's better to play chess with your hands face up. Uh, like doing. Oh, I see. I thought you meant like test hands, and I was like, I'm pretty sure you do those face up, but you mean like playing against someone else, type of yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like like a testing partner, yeah. Yeah, I used to do that with Cody. He showed me that, and it was just like a lot more interesting too. Um. Yeah, you get to talk about it, and you know, rather than practice against bad plays, you could, their play should be, and then practice against like better plays, and you know, you can. I think also because like there's so many choices what often ends up happening is like you pick a deck or you pick like a couple of different decks and then you tend to learn those decks pretty well and the other the other decks you end up you know knowing because you've sat across from them but not so much knowing as if you would know them had you played them and so when you play test with hands face up and you just play test against like you know standard decks like you end up learning a lot more as if you had been playing that deck yourself, even if you don't. Oh, I see. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I know, like, there was this period, I think it was before YCS Hartford or something, uh, Charlie, I don't freaking remember, where, like, I didn't know what decks to play. Um, so I ended up just testing a bunch of them, and I learned, like, so much that just helped me, like, when I faced the decks later. Which I would never have known if I didn't sit down and actually try to learn the deck on my own type of thing. Right, yeah. Yeah, so then that was like super beneficial for sure. Um, and then the face of hand is really good. And then I think a lot of people struggle to find like-minded people. Um, because like, I don't know, like... A lot of people's locals aren't actually very competitive. It's like, I know one person was telling me like, oh, his locals has like one tier player type of a thing um like it's all just like rogue decks and stuff so like where can people go if they want to find more like like-minded people to play with yeah sure i mean i think online is a really good resource in general because you know there's people all kinds of people and so it, it's a lot easier to find like a group of people that want to be competitive uh if you have like the whole world is the audience instead and you know that was kind of how I did it too. And, you know, it was 15 years ago kind of thing. And so like, the, I feel like the online communities were like smaller. And so there's definitely a lot of like resources and um, stuff like that. But yeah, online, if, if there's no one around you. Okay, cool. Join my discord. If you want to be more competitive, we'll, we'll make a competitive <laughs> channel. That'd be sick. Awesome. Okay. So like, kind of like, what was the point where in your career where you were like, damn, I'm like an excellent player? Or like you felt good enough to write a book? Like what was that? Um, so for the thing that I wanted for like a long time was to have the most tops of any player. Uh, because I saw tops as like consistency, whereas like you know, I, I've known people who won events on like their first top and then, you know, some percentage of those go on and top like a bunch more and some percentage of them just like that's, you know, that's their top, right? And so like you can look at wins, but I think wins are kind of like a double-edged sword to look at. Um, so I always wanted tops because I also felt like if you wanted to win and then you did win, then you would lose whatever drive you did have because then you kind of like you got the thing you wanted, essentially. Um, and so what I always wanted to shoot for was the most tops. And then I, you know, I ended up doing at the end of 2014. And that was, that, that felt pretty good. Okay, cool. Um, and then, like, who was your, whose idea was it for you to write a book? Is that something that you came up with? Or were other people, like, telling you to do it? Yeah, it was mostly my idea. Um, I, you know, I was coming up on the, in the college, and uh, I didn't really know what I wanted to do next. Like, I, I majored in political science, and I worked on a on a presidential campaign after that. But then, you know, I ended up, you know, doing a tech startup, and so I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, I just didn't know how much longer I would be in the game, so I just figured I might as well share what I know. Okay, that's good. Um. 
Who do you think is the best player in the game right now? Right now? Um, probably Jesse. Okay. Go. <laughs> Jesse's insane. But there, there's a bunch of people that are really good right now. Uh, you know, G is insane. He's the most consistent. Raph, he, he's topped almost every event this year. Uh, Chris is <laughs> legendary. Um, so, the, I mean, there's a bunch of Tommy. There's a, you know, a ton of really good play, people in the game right now. But if I had to pick one, yeah, I'd say Jesse. Okay, cool. I like Jesse a lot. Jesse's really nice. Um, which skills do you think Yu Gi Oh emphasizes that other TCGs or comp games don't? Um, so, I mean, if you look at what deck building is, because I think that's fundamentally the difference of Yu Gi Oh and most other games. Uh, what does you what does deck building take? Um, I don't know what deck like. I don't know how to like summarize what deck building takes because you know every game has you know a lot of overlap for sure. Because like there's deck building in other games. It's just I think that in game play probably is more impactful in those games on the result of the match. Whereas in Yu Gi Oh, I think deck building tends to be more impactful. Um. And so, like, other games in Yu-Gi-Oh! will share, you know, the same, but the skills that matter most would be, like, whatever is, I think, defining about deck building. Okay. Um, according to Polly, he was saying that you had some comments on, like, 60-card decks um, in your book, and he's wondering if you've changed your thoughts on them. So what I think about 60 card decks is that in the long run, uh, it's likely that every deck will play 60 cards, or at the very least, uh, that you would want to. Um, now, I think that this has been uh, basically like a graph where, you know, for most of the game, I think that the cards weren't good enough and that you would have to sacrifice a large amount of consistency to be able to, uh, you know, play more than 40 cards. Because I think for most of the game, there probably weren't even 40 cards you wanted to play. Um, maybe like 30, 35, something like that in any given deck. But I do think it's like a number that uh, probably changes depending on the deck that you're playing. Because let's say I'm playing Exodia, the ideal number of cards in my deck is five, right? Uh, whereas if I'm playing most other decks, if I play five cards in my deck, I'm just going to like not have a win condition, right? And so it, the ideal number of cards isn't necessarily like the lowest it possibly can be. It, it would be dependent on the deck. Um, but as cards get better and better, we get cards like Mechanic, you know, Sprint, uh, just Tears, things that search out of your deck um, and make like a new Tactics card, for example, that make cards more accessible. Um, I think like adding more cards to your deck, you have to like sacrifice less consistency. And so what you gain by doing that is more power. Um, and you know, if, if you can basically choose to have a higher ceiling and not have to sacrifice the consistency, then at some point, you know, new cards coming out that, may, that are just like better and better. I do think that it's going to tip. And I think it may be already started to where I don't think that now you really want to play like a 60 card deck necessarily. Um, but it's because you have to do things like make your mills worse. Uh, you know, you're not going to mill tiers as often if you have the same number of tiers in your deck and you're playing, you know, 20 extra cards, right? Um, but I do think that the ideal number in like the current format could likely be above 40. And I think that in general, the longer the game is played, uh it'll continue to rise until we get to the maximum okay interesting i never thought about it that way <laughs> yeah i know that new triple tactics tasking card is like kind of nuts um yeah it's cool I like it yeah okay um let's see uh, what's your kind of goals for Yu-Gi-Oh now? Like, do you want to go back to trying to get as many tops as possible? Or, like, what are you looking for? I don't fundamentally believe in goals. Uh, I think they're, they're kind of counterproductive. Because I think they're kind of limiting. 
in a way. Like if you, you know, like I was talking about with like winning tops over wins earlier, is that like, you know, if you came, if you come back and you say, I want to win a YCS and then you do, then it's like, you're going to lose that motivation because you got the thing you wanted. And so I just want to, you know, I want to play competitively and then see what can happen because I feel like my experience is that like you can kind of surprise yourself if you don't limit yourself with goals. That's true. Cause like, I know like if I were to pick goals, I would pick them like really, really low. Um, because like, I'm like, I'm not very good at the game. Um, but like, I guess that happened with Drytron. I didn't think that I would ever do well because I was like, Oh, I've never played combo before. I've been playing for like a couple of months. But then I did well, and it was like, whoa, that was dope. And like, rather than stress yeah. myself out over a goal, I just did whatever I felt like doing. So I, I can see that. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, is there anything else you want to talk about that we didn't touch on? Anything you want to share? Um, nothing in particular. I appreciate you having me on here, though. Okay, cool. Are you still down to have a post-photon hypernova duel? Yeah, sure. It will be my first game. <laughs> okay, sweet. So I'll have of the as new much set. advantage as possible. Okay, uh, <laughs> please like, comment, subscribe if you enjoyed the podcast. And I will see you guys soon. <laughs>